a presentation from the whole country, the UK. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce Yvonne Hillier, who uh, I've worked with for many years and who I know has been beavering away and creating links between research and practice in so many different uh, avenues for quite a long time. So I think you'll have, Yvonne will have a lot of interesting ideas to share to us. Yvonne. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And again, can I first of all thank Rob and members of Dialogue and you, Ken, for in inviting me. And I'm delighted to be here. And it's just a joy to talk to people from all over Europe. Um, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the UK, but from the English example. And you, I think, will be aware by now that the four countries of the UK are going off in different directions. And our systems, our education systems, are changing a lot. And I suppose my thought for the day is if you watch what's going on in England you might like to learn from it and then not do what we've been doing which is what Scotland tends to do. Um, okay so I'm going to start with the problem and again I'm going to need to explain a little bit about some of the terminology. The lifelong learning sector or system as far as the English are concerned covers further education, vocational education etc, professional development. It covers adult and community learning and it covers work-based learning so it's very very large uh, and it has links with higher education, links with the school system, links basically with everybody. So this system, the further education system, is huge and one of the things that a colleague of mine, Anne Thompson, and I talked about quite a few years ago now is that when we look at research in that system, the trouble is, one of its problems is that it's patchy um, and it's of not coordinated usually and very few people know and learn from the research that does go on and so one of the problems that I think we need to recognize today is, is, is this. Um, and one of the people that we have spoken to in terms of research that we've done, and again, this is a colleague of mine called Yvonne Appleby, um, about research and practice in this sector, is that if you, if you inhabit what somebody called the desert, that is further education in, in, in relation to research, the desert of research, then practitioner research is a really important aspect of what we do. And I'm going to share with you today one example of how we have worked together with practitioners to try and foster research in a system that in the main has not been um, able to enjoy the benefits of certainly funded research. Okay, and it's quite interesting to be able to follow on from Karen's uh, presentation because we have argued that networks are really, really important and one of, I think, those factors that might influence the way that uh, research can progress. And of course we have this problem that this kind of knowledge, what some people will call mode two knowledge, applied knowledge and so on, is often disregarded by people who are making decisions about the quality of research or making decisions about the funding of research. So there's a, there's a, a, a real job to do, I would say. So let me just again give you a little bit of context about research and how it's funded in England and also more generally in the United Kingdom. We have a, a big council called the Economic and Social Science Research Council, ESRC, that funds research across that social science discipline, politics, um, economics, so, uh, sociology, criminology, all of these disciplines. And I decided to have a little look when I was preparing for this just to see how much educational research was funded last year at which point I got very depressed because there were 62 applications for education and this is across the board from you know sort of education of um, early years school etc 62 uh, applications only two were funded and yet, when you look at the, they, they have to be refereed by external referees, 40% of those, the highest in all of those disciplines, were outstanding, in other words, warranted re research funding. So we've got another problem, which is that if we look for funding to help our research from something like a big funding council, we're not getting anywhere, and we're spending a lot of time trying to find this funding. 
There are other institutions that we can call upon. The Nuffield, which is a foundation, has funded research, particularly for the 14 to 19 age group, which again begins to span school and post-compulsory. And we do have associations that support our research, like the British Education Research Association. It doesn't have funds itself, but it helps disseminate. Um, learning and skills improvement, I'm sorry about the jargon, but if you, if you work in England, you just have to deal with the jargon. We've got lots of acronyms and lots of institutions and agencies, and they keep changing. Some get closed down, some get started up. This one, the Learning and Skills Improvement Service, is about to close in August. And I'll come back and tell you a bit more about them too. We have the National Institute of Adult and Continuing Education, and it's a little bit like the Irish example that you're going to hear about later. It, again, disseminates a lot of research and information and has been an absolute lobby for, for adult and community learning, including work-based learning, further education, and so on. It's, it's a, it has been, in the past, quite powerful from time to time to try and influence government. Um, but it's, again, at the moment, in our times of economic difficulty, it's having to fight its corner for ensuring that adult and community learning continues. But we also, in England, have what are called awarding bodies that award qualifications. And these two, City and Guild, Centre for Excellence and Skills Development, and Edexcel, both have got involved in supporting research into this vast sector. So although we have got problems of trying to get money from the large funding councils, it is possible to try and work with other institutions and agencies that are keen to promote what I would term practitioner research. And the reason I'm um, sort, of, sort of talking about these will be, I hope, clearer in a minute. So what I'm now going to do is talk about two examples of where practitioner research with institutions has worked. And the first one I'm going to talk about, which is why this has been on the top of my slides throughout, is the Learning and Skills Research Network. Now, everybody else so far has shown you pictures of their institution, you know, where they work and so on. There's no picture of LSRN because we don't have a building. In fact, we don't have a constitution, and we certainly don't have any money. But we've been going since 1996, and this might be, again, one of those opportunities to think about how can you do this. And I quite like what's called working in the interstices, you know, dipping and diving and moving around. And I think this might be um, a way forward. We decided in the mid-90s that people who work in, to begin with further education, but we um, expanded it to adult and community and work-based learning, did have sometimes people from higher education, and I'm now a big grown-up girl and I work in the higher education sector, but I didn't used to, and people from higher education would come and do research to people in other sectors. And the people in the further education sector are really quite smart themselves, and they can, in fact, do their own research. But they don't have the legitimacy to do it, and they don't have the time and the funding and so on. And so again, back to what factors will help. We set up a membership network of people who might be doing their own master's degrees, doctorates, might be doing development type work that has the opportunity to be turned into research and questions, research questions of that work. So we'd set up a, um, a membership network. As I say, we didn't have a structure, which turned out to be a good idea. We didn't plan this, by the way. We're not that smart. But it, the consequence of what we did seems to have worked quite well. But we did identify a set of core values and principles about what kind of research it should be and who we think should be doing it. And those core values and that have carried us through. Um, in, importantly, we had members from both higher education, further education, and indeed um, from other agencies as well. And that is a really important aspect because people from higher education do have that legitimate role of doing research and they're meant to have the time to do it. I mean, I know it's increasingly difficult and so on. But, and most of those people from higher education, in a way like me, came from an adult 
in my case, literacy background. So they'd actually worked in those other sectors and they, they brought with them that knowledge and that culture of those other sectors, which I think is also quite important. Um, as I say, we later included these and we again and it's going back to the idea of regionality we had local people who were champions that believed in doing this research and were prepared to spend time and it was donating their time actually to working in the region so we had a national network in fact we had a, a relationship with Northern Ireland and we had a relationship with um, Scotland as well in their further education um, unit we we didn't quite have such a good relationship with Wales and I've never understood that but then I've never understood Wales to be honest so um, and so we had local champions the next thing we did and this is the evolving story is we realized that we most people in practitioners don't read academic journals and sometimes when you read what's in them you can't blame them I mean it's you know, difficult. So we decided we needed a journal and we had an organisation called the Learning Skills Development Agency which eventually became this one I mentioned earlier, ELSIS, and they were prepared to help us create a journal. And so what we did is we wanted to have people who were engaged in inquiry to find a way to disseminate and we had Proper, art, proper articles, but we had sound bites as well. So it made it very accessible for people. And that, again, this is, of course, in the days before we had a sort of electronic means of disseminating. So, you know, obviously it was of its time. But we realised that that worked quite well. And we've managed to keep going. Learning and Skills Development Agency was closed down. So one of our sources of support and funding went by the way. And... Um, Andrew Morris, myself and Anne Thompson got together and said we can't let this go, we can't let it you know, just die. And so we organised a meeting where we asked anybody that we thought might have practitioner research as part of its remit to come and meet and agree whether or not they wanted to support us. And they all did. So NIACE, for example, funds or underwrites our annual conference. The Learning and Skills Improvement Service actually works with us and sponsors us, as does some of the others as well. So we've continued to get people working with us because we notice that they themselves have a need to disseminate and so on. So if you can find you know, a way that was a symbiotic way, it seems to be quite helpful. And so what we've got are some footprints that are left behind the journal, which of course unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, talking about awards, and again it's quite interesting about how to encourage people to um, engage. We ended up having an annual award in our conference for the best paper, and Anne Thompson and I brought those together into an edited book. And if we were able to do so, I think we'd continue this, this process. Uh, we ended up with regional um, projects that were sponsored by uh, the, the development agency, but actually enabled people from further education, adult education, work-based learning, and the universities to work together. And it wasn't the universities telling everybody what to do. It was that collaboration, and that was quite important. So we've got regional projects that um, we produced. Um, we've got a, uh, don't look at our website, we've got a slight problem with it at the moment because one of our supporting um, agencies is not in a position to help us, but it will be back soon. And so we've got other sorts of influences that we have, I think, can, um, can claim that we've got. So... This is Learning and Skills Improvement Service, but again, unfortunately, it's losing its funding. And I will talk about the challenge of, of this in the future. But um, we've got other organisations that help us in that dissemination. Ofsted is actually an inspection body that looks at the quality of teaching and learning across the whole education system but as a result of that it does identify pockets of good practice so it is possible to work with an organization that is primarily involved in making judgments 
to make use of what they find. But this Institute for Learning is another membership organisation which has got a bit of a politically charged um, experience at the moment but also has been sponsoring practitioner research so as a result of the early you know work that we've done there have been some agencies that have actually in England got very involved and support that form of research okay so what I wanted to do is just say that the uh, two minutes on what kind of research this is and why we are um, so keen to, to uh, be involved with it. Again, some of you will know that reflective practice is a, an absolute key component of professional development of people who work in the education system. But of course, if you link that to uh, um, identifying and making explicit people's tacit knowledge, it makes it possible to ask questions of that. And if you ask questions of that, then it's possible to undertake research into that practice. So this process is something that we promote as a way of ensuring that we, we look at our practice. And of course, that obviously requires a strategy for research that acknowledges this way of looking at the world. And just to sort of give you a, a sort of diagram of, of what we're trying to achieve, at the moment, it's almost as though there's an awful lot of stuff down here that's tacit and hidden and what we're suggesting is that by research we can bring this almost like into the light and make it open but as I say more importantly once things are in the open and explicit they become for me testable statements that can turn into practice and I think particularly when we're trying to bridge that gap between what might be called blue skies research and that notion of applied research we're actually asking people to think about what they do it but in a different way and to ask questions of it so i think i'm i'm can't, rob's already told me i've got too many slides so i won't say too much but you can see that we are making that link between reflective practice and research and again um, you can see that if you put practitioners in the middle, you've got an awful lot of aspects. Of, sorry about this. I'm just showing off that I can make bouncy things on my slide. <laughs> Last one. Okay. Th those constituents, I think, are also quite important for us when we think about um, where, we, if we put practitioners in the middle. And we have got, particularly in England, we love testing and we love judging and we love putting people through pain and so institutional compliance is an absolute key component of the context in which people are operating but we've got and this for me is really important we've got individual agency and it's the one aspect I think of re research and practice that perhaps can help people um, sort of avoid the worst of this okay and I would just want to point out that, again, that notion of research, what we're trying to achieve, perhaps is relating to wisdom and phrenesis. In other words, informed judgment about what we do, rather than just complying to issues around quality. You can tell I've got the English model completely, you know, I've got the chip in my brain that tells me I've got to talk about quality and compliance. Um, okay. I'm going to move now on to something completely different because uh, Rob also asked me to talk about work that I do down in Brighton. The University of Brighton has got a community university partner pro um, project called, or program called CUP. And one of the reasons when I first went to Brighton seven years ago, I thought it was such a good place to work, was because it had this program. So Brighton has recognised very early on that it, one of its key aims and one of its key activities relates to working in the community and we have got campuses across the south coast and one of the places that we've very recently created as a campus is in Hastings. Now most of you will know about Hastings as in the Battle of Hastings. Hastings is a coastal town that is one of the most deprived towns, deprived coastal towns there is. 
very poor infrastructure back into places like London and so on. Because it's a coastal town, of course half of it is by the sea, so you can't expand and do anything. Um, waves of people that were in the post-war years taken out of London and placed there because there wasn't enough housing for them in London, completely changing the profile of the town. Generations of people that haven't worked, there are people who are very wealthy there and there's a very thriving artistic community, but it has a lot of problems. And we were asked by the community partners to help them understand what was going on in their education system. And I mentioned testing. Because we test the children so much in England, we've got a lot of data about them. And this slide puts the perspective of what the problem is and why we ended up working with them. When the children were little, when they were about five, two-thirds of them were on track. In other words, test, let's not go into what the testing is and whether or not it should have been done and so on, but just take it for granted that at the moment, when they were five, two-thirds of them were okay. There was still a third that wasn't, but two-thirds were okay. As they were tested, some children improved, some children didn't. By the time they were 16, two-thirds of them were underperforming. Now, when you think about that, that's an incredibly difficult situation to be managing. And we have to ask what has been going on in the system, in the school system, that it's got to be that bad. And that's what we were asked to do. And we've done a number of projects uh, working in the community. But the one I just wanted to share with you was about um, working with parents as researchers. So now I'm giving you an example of where we've moved completely um, away, not just from practitioners as researchers, but actually making use of people in the community. And Turning Point is an organisation that um, thought that and they'd use this as um, a, a way with service users in social services, but they thought that what they wanted to do is get parents and young people to talk to other parents and young people about some of these, these problems. And we've done a number of projects, and the only one I'm, I'm if I've got time, which won't be much, is, is to talk about, if you think about that, that diagram of children beginning not to achieve over time, you have to ask the question, what's going on intergenerationally? So what's happening with the parents and their learning? What's happening with their way of working with the schools? What's happening with their views of education? How can we encourage families to engage with education and not just assume that what we have to do is work with children in the schools? So we wanted to start with the very little children and find out what use their parents were making or of, um, children's centres which was set up by government to try and help this situation and so we wanted to do all sorts of questions like this um, about finding out how we can talk to parents and so on um, and we got I'm going to really skip because I know you can um, I wish now I just put these all that came up straight away <laughs> um, We've, we got parents as researchers to get involved right from the very beginning. And the good thing about parents, of course, is they know what it's like to go and talk to another parent. They know what it's like to live in the community. They understand why some people might not get involved, etc. And so we recruited parents to actually talk to other parents. We had all sorts of problems getting parents to be able to talk to other parents, creating crash facilities, etc., etc., etc. But as a result of that, we ended up with some really important lessons. I hate nosy people. Some people assumed that the children's centre was only for people that were known to social services, i.e. that they were in need, that they were um, you know, not very good parents and so on. And if you've got that view, why would you go to a children's centre? Because that's for other people, not for me because I'm doing a good job and so on. And there might be people from like social workers there who would be looking at what they do. Now that kind of thing is unlikely to come from talking to a stranger, but parents will talk to each other like that. So this is the, the value of it and so on. Um, and obviously there is that, that we were capturing that sense of, I've got too many things to do, I can't possibly get involved in education. Um, but again, to talk about the benefits, one of the volunteers is now working, so she herself was on benefits. She's off benefits now. We've got um, 
the centre itself found out that m virtually all the parents use Facebook. Now, there's a myth around people in deprived communities that they haven't got access to the internet and da 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 Everybody was on Facebook. Not Twitter. Twitter is clearly a middle class thing. But everybody, everybody was on Facebook. So the parent centre has now got permission to, to have Facebook on its own page and so on. So it can be in touch with that. Um, and they are obviously keen to carry on doing research. So, what does this mean for, for all of us? Well, obviously, practice itself involves change. And David Bowd and Paul Hager, who um, write a lot, they're based in Australia, talk about what we need to do in terms of being professional and the learning that we do. And what, we're, what they also talk about is that practice is emergent, it's ongoing and so on. So of course if we're trying to capture this practice, what we've got to do is recognise that um, it's, it's not something that you can just fix and hold. And so what we have to do is take account of the context, and the context I think is, is really important. So what are, the, what are, in a sense, the, the lessons, I think, that we've learned? And also, perhaps, again, for discussion, right? We do need to keep connected. It's really, that, that sense of networking is re desperately important. And it needs structure. Although I talked about LSRN, you know, the Learning Skills Research Network, is something that was without structure. But we rely on the structures of others. So it can only work because others have got structure. It does need to be done driven, I think, locally, even though there might be you know, national. You need institutional buy-in. And of course, ultimately, it's around individuals and people and, and, and what works. But just to go back to the current challenge for England, is we had a review of professionalism in the sector. And some of those organizations like Ellis uh, Elsis is going to be disbanding and we don't know yet whether or not further um, research will be part of a new body which is going to be called the FE Guild and we've been lobbying quite hard to try and make sure that they hear that message. Um, I've mentioned the fact that we've got a really low rate of achievement of funding when we do apply to the, if you like, the, the, the big places and that. And so we're really worried about practitioner research and so that's a huge challenge for us. Sorry. So I think just to, just to conclude, I think I've done it in time, is just to leave you with a thought for the day. <laughs> And to thank everyone for your attention, thank you.